Hello. Welcome to Breaking It All Down. I'm Count Zero. Well, this episode we are finally finishing the best of the rest for Nintendo Power's first year, 1988 through 1989. I have one correction to make this time. I had put Robocop on my spreadsheet twice, and I'd forgotten to mark Hudson's Adventure Island as reviewed, which would have brought this one up, this episode up to 11. My bad. So this time, I'll only be covering 10 titles instead of 11. So for all the previous numbers on this list, just bump them all up by one. Still, that gives us 10 titles to cover this episode, so we've got a lot of ground to cover. Let's get started. Number 10, Rygar by Tecmo. 1,395 points. Rygar is probably the fourth side-scrolling, or semi-sold side-scrolling, Zelda-styled RPG I've reviewed thus far, including Zelda 2, and it's also the worst. This isn't because of the controls or the gameplay, both of those are fine. It's due to the fact that, well, this is the first Zelda 2 styled game I've played thus far that doesn't let you continue. If you die in the game once, you go back to the beginning of the game. Now, even on the own, in a more traditional action game like Contra or Ninja Gaiden, this would be frustrating, but all it would really do is put the game in the territory of bad, but not terrible. No, what makes this game design decision make this game truly terrible is the fact that in order to progress in this game, you have to grind. You see, in this game, you gather two different kinds of experience to level up your character. Tone, which increases your attack power, and Last, which increases your health. The last one, no pun intended, is the most important because of the whole lack of continues thing. However, you don't just gain Last XP by killing enemies. No, no, you see, you gain it by picking up items that some, but not all, of the enemies drop when you kill them. This means you have to grind like hell. This also makes the inability to continue, and takes this whole game from merely bad to truly, unforgivably terrible. Number 9. Bad Dudes by Data East. 1,479 points. Bad Dudes is a home port of a fairly successful arcade brawler. One which is probably best known for its simplistically silly story, one which is so well known, I don't even need to show you the opening cutscene. The president has been kidnapped by ninjas. Are you a bad enough dude to save him? However, it's also a game which controls very well, with one real significant problem. Limited continues. Yeah, if you had unlimited continues, you could probably beat this game in, oh, a couple hours. On the other hand, though, if you're playing this game in the arcade, you really have as many continues as you had quarters, and assuming that you, the game cost, oh, $30 on release, and you used as many quarters in the arcade as you spent on the game, that's about 120 continues. As an aside, this gives me an interesting little gameplay idea for any future arcade ports of retro video games or whatever. Or if somebody decides they want to go back and make a retro-styled arcade game or something like that. Just a thought to put out there for all you indie game developers or whoever out there. Inclu if you're going to include limited continues in the game, take a cue from the uh, cost of how of your game and how much it would be in quarters. And give the player a number of continues equal to the price in quarters. So say if you have if your game is shipping at a ten dollar price point on Steam or GOG or whatever for your retro arcade style game and you want to give limited continues, give them forty continues to get through the entire game. Once they run out hit, hit those forty continues, they have to start all the way back over from the beginning. It's an interesting idea and gives kind of replicates okay, you're playing this game in the arcade and you have ten bucks and quarters with which to get through the game, and it's a 20, uh, 25 cent credit. Or whatever your yen equivalent is if you're a Japanese game developer watching this. An uh, indie game developer. Just a thought that popped out of my head. Moving on, back to the game. Aside from the continues issue, Bad Dude's biggest weakness is the fact that, that the developers tried to basically put the same number of characters and by characters I mean sprites, on screen at once in the home version as they did in the arcade version, with the problem being that the NES's hardware simply can't handle it leading to on-screen flicker. 
This is particularly noticeable whenever one of the white ninjas dumps caltrops on screen. From a coding standpoint, each caltrop counts as one character or sprite. Thus, once the caltrops are thrown, the number of enemies on screen is immediately increased by four. Now, from a coding standpoint, or what have you, this is fairly straightforward to fix. You put a hard limit on the number of characters on screen at once and dump the caltrop throwing enemy. This is how Double Dragon on the NES handled things. A hard cap on the number of enemies on screen, this including objects and weapons, and limitations on the type of weapons enemies use. Nothing that would be thrown and be left behind, or like scatter obstacles to deny access to a certain area of the screen. It speaks to Data East's dedication to bring as much to, bringing as much of the arcade experience to the home as possible, that they tried to incorporate gameplay elements from the arcade version over the NES's memory restrictions, but it still leads to a game where you get lots of on-screen flicker fairly often at times. It's a noble, though distinctly flawed, effort. Number 8, Town & Country Surf Design by LJN and Atlas. 2,339 points. This game is a complete pile of hot garbage. It consists of two mini-games, one a surfing event, the other a street skateboarding event, where both involve trying to get the highest score possible while avoiding obstacles and reaching the end of the hypothetical course. However, the controls are just too frustrating to make either minigame fun. Even if you complete either one, it, it, there's only one course, so it's not like there's real replay value aside from trying to get a higher score. Just, if you want a skating game, or extreme sports game or something like that from the 8-bit era, Get Skater Die instead. Number 7. 1943 by Capcom. 3,950 points. This game is a considerable improvement over 1942. The game adds some basic leveling up mechanics, along with a password system and a continue system, both of which makes the game considerably more fun, and also puts it heads or tails above other shooters for the NES. It's also developed by Capcom themselves, as opposed to a third party like Tosei or Micronix. I still wouldn't play this game without the assistance of a controller with Turbofire, though, but it's definitely much more fun than several of the other shooters I've played thus far. Number 6. Rampage by Data East and Midway. 4,659 points. If Rampage looks familiar to you, that's because Fixit Felix Jr., the game from Wreck-It Ralph, is basically kind of the reverse of Rampage, where you're trying to pick up the pieces of what the rampaging monster has done. This is a fairly good port of the arcade version, albeit one with a smaller number of monsters to choose from, but it still controls very well. The game also caused a very simple continue system. While your death animation is taking place, just mash the B button, and you get your health back and you don't lose any points. The controls are solid and the game is generally fun, and I enjoy the game a lot more than I am now if I was playing it as a two-player game. In fact, I'm considering this strongly for my two-player pick of the episode. Number 5. Double Dribble by Konami. 4,928 points. I'm really not a fan of console basketball games. As mentioned earlier, I don't really like to play sports as video games that I could or have in the past played better in real life. Well, this game is one which definitely scratches that I could do better than this right now in a pickup basketball game with a bunch of friends, so I'll go do that instead. Itch. Number 4, Top Gun by Konami. 5,235 points. And we have another game on the list that was previously reviewed by the Angry Video Game Nerd. If you haven't seen his review, Top Gun is a flight simulator which you play on a controller with a D-pad that has two buttons. Technically four, if you include start and select. Now, if you're starting to detect a problem with that description of the controls, it is a problem. At this point in gaming history, most quality flight simulators were on home desktop computers, like Ataris and Commodores and um, what were then referred to as IBM-compatible desktops. As with a keyboard and a joystick, you have enough buttons to handle diff different things like different throttle speeds, switching between different kinds of weapons, pitch and yaw, and all that sort of stuff. 
as opposed to Top Gun, which can handle a maximum of two weapons and basically one speed for the airplanes, which ultimately turns the game into an inferior afterburner clone. Skip it. Number three, Mylon Secret Castle by Hudson Soft. 5,952 points. A while back, when I was reviewing Mickey Mouse Capade, I described a concept I referred to as block bitching. The idea that in order to progress through a game, you have to shoot an invisible block that you can't see otherwise. This in turn requires you to play the game by shooting at pretty much everything in order to find whatever you need to progress. If I was to pick one game as the er example of block bitching, it would be Mylon's Secret Castle. As it is, the shooting controls are crappy anyway, as instead of shooting straight ahead, you shoot at a weird angle either kind of up by like 30 degrees or down 30 degrees, and the run is this weird sort of acceleration thing going on where instead of like moving at a constant rate and then holding down a button to sprint, you move at a normal rate for a few steps and then start speeding up, which makes it difficult to kind of control and set up for certain jumps and that sort of thing. I just would recommend not playing this game. Number two, Mega Man by Capcom. 7,955 points. Frankly, Mega Man is not a good start to the series. Everything just isn't quite as precise as later games in the series. You have this kind of weird skid when you stop moving, you kind of don't jump as precisely as you do normally, the sprites seem a little bit bigger on screen, or alternatively, your perspective is slightly closer in. Honestly, every other game in the series is better than this one, in some fashion or another. I would say this game is certainly worth checking out if you want to see how the series begins, but if you want to skip this title, you're not missing anything. Aside from maybe a few of the iconic bosses like Gutsman and that sort of thing, but some of them show up in later games anyway, so you're fine skipping this game entirely. Number 1. Castlevania by Konami 9,886 points. Castlevania is a game that, like Ninja Gaiden, is well known for being absurdly hard and absurdly fun. Both games have massive amounts of character. Ninja Gaiden brings it out through its lavish cutscenes, well, lavish for the time, and Castlevania brings it out through its gothic atmosphere and the design of the enemies. The levels are brilliantly designed, though both have cheap enemies. Um... However, I found that while two, the two games have their strengths, I like Castlevania more. For me, the gothic atmosphere appeals to me more, and I've noticed that the enemy spawns feel more balanced here than they do with Ninja Gaiden. You don't often run into a situation where, because the scroll of the level has reached a certain point, you have one group of enemy endlessly spawning over and over again, cuz. My two-player pick for this week is Rampage, which provides an excellent experience for two players. Definitely something where, if you're going to sit down and play a classic arcade game on a home console with a friend, this is a pretty good way to go if you're if you're on the NES, as opposed to Genesis or Super Nintendo or any other game system. It, it's a good game to go with. The single-player pick, I have to say the number one game on the list overall is definitely a worthy pick for Pick of the Week, and that is Castlevania. It is the start of one of my favorite video game franchises. As I mentioned in the review of the game itself, while both this and Ninja Gaiden have a kind of similar connection to each other in terms of difficulty and controls and that sort of thing, I like Castlevania a little more. It's sort of gothic horror atmosphere that appeals to me. And the music... The music in, in both games is both good but I like the music in Castlevania a little more. So, next week we start Nintendo... Well, next episode we start Nintendo Power's second year. And I'm looking forward to cover, through, covering through all of this because we have the Game Boy coming out. And I'm looking forward to covering some of the games there. And also there's the matter of Tetris. Gotta love Tetris. So... If you enjoyed this episode, 
please like this video or give it a thumbs up on YouTube or wherever else you're watching this. And please subscribe to my channel if you want to know when the next episode comes out. So, until next time, I'll see you then.